are thrilled to have this exquisite illuminated manuscript book of ours with a touching inscription by the teenage Mary Queen of Scots in the 1550s here with us on display. It's in the Renaissance Gallery in the Kingdom of Scots, surrounded by the types of furniture and jewellery that Mary would have lived amongst in her life. Books of ours like these are collections of psalms and prayers for use at different times in the day, so for vespers, matins, and so on, and also at different times in the ecclesiastical year, so for Easter, for Advent, for Christmas, and so on. They are really a tool for prayer. You carry them around with you. It means that you can say your prayers at the right time of day, and books of ours like this would have been very much something Mary would have had on her person most of the time or access to. She would have used them in private prayer, perhaps kneeling on a cushion with the book open on a lectern in front of her, possibly with a statue of uh, the Virgin Mary or of Christ on the crucifix before her. The prayer book, when you first see it, it seems incredibly small when you open it. It, you, it could fit into the palm of your hands. It does seem absolutely minute, which makes the detail in the images all the more astonishing. The book is also incredibly tightly bound, so although it's very small in page size, it is actually quite thick. So 200 pages on vellum. So this isn't paper, this is made from the skin of an animal. It's slightly thicker. It's very fine vellum, but um, it's a thicker book. It would have been made also to be portable. This is something that you didn't just put away on a bookshelf and never see again. This was something of daily use. And you can see some of the rubbings on the book that indicate the usage of it over the years. So it maybe was carried, possibly in a little container, maybe a little velvet bag or something attached to the waist of the person who owned it. The other notable fact to think about this particular prayer book is actually the very little signs of use. So yes, there is some rubbing, but in fact, the prayer book is in incredibly good condition considering it was made, gosh, nearly 480 years ago. And I think what that probably attests to is the value, the reverence in which it has been held as a relic of Mary over the succeeding centuries. So no one's been using it after that every day to do their prayers. But we're going to open our display with the touching inscription by Mary Queen of Scots to her great aunt, Louise de Bourbon, abbess of Fontevraud Abbey in France. And she wrote this inscription to her great aunt in the late 1550s. Puis que voulez que si me ramontoi, on vos prières et tout horizon, et vous requier première qui vous soin, qu'elle parte ou en mis affection. Va, tu mériteras. Mary signs her little composition with the motto va to merit or us, go, you will be deserving, and then finishes it with a monogram that combines her initials, M, with that of her husband, the French Dauphin Francois, with the Greek letter phi, the phonetic representation of the letter F for Francois. And throughout this book, there are just exquisite illuminations and illuminated capitals. But what's also interesting is not just the subjects of the illuminations themselves, but the borders of the illuminations containing really quite detailed iconography relating to whatever it is that's in the image. So for instance, for the crucifixion, we have 16 of Judas's 30 pieces of silver. We have the nails from the cross and the dice used by the soldiers who are playing to win Christ's clothing. The book was commissioned by 
Mary's great aunt, Louise de Bourbon, who was a very powerful, probably quite a well off abbess at Fontevraud, and Fontevraud was a royal abbey. And when she became abbess of this abbey in 1534, it's thought that she commissioned this exquisite prayer book. She employed to do so the extremely talented, skilled master artist that was associated with the Archbishop Francois de Rohan. Moving forward a decade, Mary, Queen of Scots, has become betrothed to the Dauphin Francois, and she marries him in some splendor in 1558. In 1559, her father-in-law, Henry II of France, dies, and Mary and Francois become, briefly, King and Queen of France. Tragically, Francois II dies in 1560, so it's a very short tenure. But during this moment, um, I think we can see Mary at the height of her powers, her glamour, a Renaissance queen in Europe, Queen of France, and of course, Queen of Scotland too. Mary will have inscribed the prayer book in the late 1550s, and we know that because of the combination of her initial with Francois's initial in the monogram. This must have been done just before or through the time of their marriage, that brief moment. It's thought that Mary's great aunt, Louise, gave Mary this book of hours, either around the time of her marriage or possibly um, around the time of her coronation. O intimerata et in aeternum benedicta, singularis atque incomparabilis virgo dei, genetrix Maria. Gratissimum dei templum, Spiritus Sancti Sacrarium, Janua Regni Caelorum, per quam post Deum totus vivit orbis terrarum, inclina, Mater, qui cum Deo Patre et Filio coeternos et consubstantialis, cum eis et in eis vivit, et regnat omnipotens Deus, in saecula saeculorum, Amen. The fact that Mary inscribed this little verse to this powerful woman, Louise de Bourbon, is a sign of, I think, the intimate connection between them, a personal and loving, affectionate relationship. She was brought up very much in France, but her mother, Mary de Guise, remained back in Scotland to reign as regent from 1554 for Mary in her place. So there we have Mary, her father's died in late 1542, her mother is in Edinburgh ruling Scotland for her, and so she's very dependent for female companionship and support and love on those French relations. Those of her mother um, amongst the de Guises and the de Bourbon families, of which Louise, the abbess, is one, and then also her Valois relatives, the relatives of the king and her husband, the Dauphin Francis. So I think the inscription is a real testament to the love that existed between Mary and Louise, but also the need that Mary had for that sort of loving support when she's on her own at the French court. Ave Maria. Gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesu. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus nunc et in ora mortis nostre. Amen. I think what's really striking about the prayer book is its representation of all the Catholic practices that the Presbyterian reformers in Scotland absolutely loathed. These were the practices that they had banned at a parliament for the Protestant Reformation in 1560. So the saying of mass, the saying of prayers in Latin, images of Christ and the saints, all these things were now banned, but yet here is this beautiful book of ours which represents all of these things illuminated with multiple pictures 
of Christ and the saints. John Knox, the Presbyterian reformer, famously met with Mary four times to argue against her use of such prayers, such practices, her use of a crucifix, her use of images of the Virgin Mary. And it says something about Mary's steadfast determination that she upheld those practices of prayer and personal devotion, despite John Knox preaching from the uh, pulpit, for instance, at St. Giles, in condemnation of those practices. I think one of the things about Mary is we all know her tragic ending, but Mary, until 1566, 1567, was actually operating as Queen of Scotland in the late 1550s, as Queen of France too. She had five pretty impressive years here in person on the throne. So what I'd like us to do here, through objects like the prayer book, like the Pennycook jewels, and the other jewellery and necklaces that we have associated with Mary, is to remember her perhaps slightly differently to the traditional images of Mary in black, Mary as the religious martyr holding her rosary and so on. And we've included in our new displays here an image of Mary really, as I would like us to remember her, captured by the French artist Francois Clouet around 1558. Mary's dressed in very fashionable pink, swathed in pearls. She is the vibrant, majestic, magnificent Mary. She's a Renaissance queen with all these wonderful European connections. And I think this is a, a different way perhaps to remember Mary rather than the one whose life is foreshadowed by our knowledge of her tragic ending.